welcome. My name is Joe Davich, and I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, the DeKalb County Public Library, the DeKalb Library Foundation, and our friends and sponsors for the Book as Art Volume 9 Muse Exhibition, the Decatur Arts Alliance, the Downtown Decatur Development Authority. Welcome to our first in our series of author talks for Book is Art Volume 9 News. We are very, very pleased to present three artists this evening whose work is featured in this exhibition to talk a little more in depth about their work. I would like to remind you, if you would like to ask questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature. You can find the Q&A button located at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. And we have enabled live transcription this evening for those of you that are hearing impaired and may need a little help um, viewing our discussion. You can find the CC button at the top or bottom of your screen as well, and you can adjust the font as needed. Once again, we would like to thank all the artists who participated this year in the Book is Art exhibition. It's been an absolutely wonderful year, and so far the response has been overwhelming. These series allow us to go a little more in depth and allow us to visit with artists here and abroad, and we hope you can join us for all the other talks that we have in this series. You can find those by signing up on our Eventbrite or visiting our Facebook page. Right now, I'd like to do a quick introduction for the artists who are participating this evening and then turn it over to them. Our first artist is Kyle Anthony Clark. He is a book artist and a book arts educator. The majority of Kyle's creative output consists of artists' books, fine bindings, photography, relief and letterpress prints. Conceptually, Kyle's artistic works explore a variety of themes, including place and the 21st century transients. In addition to producing his own works, Kyle collaborates with other artists, writers, and other creative professionals. He was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and lived the first quarter of the century of his life in the Southeastern United States. After studying book arts at the University of Alabama's MFA Book Arts Program, Kyle worked in book conservation at Emory University and continues to work in book conservation at the University of Michigan Library. Additionally, Kyle has had the opportunity to teach bookbinding and lecture on book arts at a variety of institutional and private venues. Those institutions include the Morgan Conservatory in Cleveland, Ohio, the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, the Robert C. Williams Papermaking Museum in Atlanta, Georgia, the Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, and other, and the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Kyle's artist books can be found in collections in UCLA, the Ohio University, Washington State, and the University of Alabama. The books that are featured in Muse this year are All Praise the Golden Dog, Reflection, which is right up here, and Wander. So the works this evening are kind of behind me orbiting around me, um, but we'll use those later this evening. Our next artist is Deborah Disman, and Deborah has participated in the Book It Is Art for several years now, so we're glad her pieces are back this year. She is a Los Angeles-based artist known for her work inspired by the book, both as a solo practitioner and in the public sphere of community engagement. As a maker and teaching artist, she creates work and projects which push the body and the boundaries of the book into new media and materials, inviting altered ways of viewing the world and how we inhabit it. Her work is shown in museums, galleries, universities, libraries, including Launch LA, the Mike Callery, Kel Kelly Gallery at Beyond Baroque in Venice, California, the Brand Library and Art Center in Glendale, California, the Long Beach Museum of Art, the Cape Cod Museum of Art, and the Charles Young Research Library at UCLA. Disman was featured as an artist in the Big Read in LA in 2016, and is the recipient of the 2016-2017 Word Artist Grant, the Bruce Geller Memorial Prize to create the Shell Train Book, a life-size book structure designed as the catalyst for community creativity, and was commissioned by Los Angeles's Craft Contemporary Museum to create an interactive book for the 2017 exhibition, Chapters, Book Arts in Southern California. She was a studio resident at the Camera Obscura Art Lab 
at 1450 Ocean in Santa Monica in 2018, and has served as an artist in residence with the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs since 2017. Deborah's piece in the book is Art, Volume 9, is called Window Treatment and is featured right here. The last artist joining us this evening is Carol Kunstadt, who works on of paper reference artifacts, antique manuscripts, and books, deconstructing paper and text and using it in metaphorical ways. An irreplaceable aspect of the book is that book absorb histories. Through the manipulation of antique materials, history, memory, and time merge in a hybrid form, revealing how language can become visual through reinterpretation. Kunstadt often invokes a metaphysical quality of contemplation and timelessness. Born in Boston with a childhood in a small New England town, Kunstadt received her Bachelor's of the Fine Arts from the Harvard Art School and continued with a postgraduate studies at the Academy der Blinken Kunsti in Munich, Germany. Seven years ago, she re-entered a familiar landscape as in her youth, moving to the Hudson Valley, having lived for 35 years in New York City. She was awarded the Kuniyoshi Fund Award in 2017. Her works are in numerous private and public collections, including the George C. Michael Department of Special Collections and Archives at Bedouin College Library, Brunswick, the Book Arts Collection in the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C., the Permanent Collection of the Center for the Book Arts in New York, New York, and the Baylor Book Arts Collection, Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Carol's pieces in this year's exhibition are Pressing On, Homage to Hannah Moore, number 91, 98, and 106, which are featured right here. So right now, I would like you to sit back and help me to welcome our first artist, Kyle Clark. Kyle. Hey, thanks. Um, thanks for the introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. And I think it's there. Excellent, so hopefully you all will be able to uh, see the presentation momentarily. There we go. Um, so uh, as Joe was saying, my name is Kyle Clark. Uh, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, and originally from Atlanta, and I'm, I'm honored to be included in everybody's work, uh, in, in the exhibition with everybody else's work. Um, I have three works included in the exhibition. I'll take a little bit of time to go through the first two and spend a slightly longer time uh, with the final work. Uh, the first book, Made in the Spring After I Lost My Father, Wander was a book made in response to grief. The process of creating Wander began with writing down sensory memories about the last year with my father. These sensory memories were translated into the poems and letterpress printed and letterpress printed in conjunction with the included photographs and relief prints. Each of the included photographs were taken in the year before my father died and serve as documentation of my time with him in the year I spent traveling back and forth between Atlanta, Georgia and Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where I lived at the time. As part of the project, I incorporated letterpress printed image, images derived from linoleum block prints that were reminiscent of botanical specimens. In addition to these relief prints, stylized laser cut paper botanical specimens were, include, were also included. Similar to pressed flowers found within old books, the choice to include botanical specimens, specimen like imagery was done in part to evoke a sense of memory and connection that you often find with intimate family heirlooms. These are two books that didn't make it into the book, but are a part of the series taken during my father's last year in Atlanta. All Praise the Golden Dog is a collaborative print made between uh, Steve Miller, aka Red Hydra Press, and myself. Steve contributed the prose to this broadside and I contributed the linoleum block print. 
Steve's prose and my print were made in remembrance and celebration of the dogs that share our lives. Reflection. Reflection was completed in my last year living in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. At the time, I didn't realize it, but Reflection was very much a transition book. Reflection was a departure from what and who I thought I wanted to be and allowed me to explore the range of possibilities and directions life could take. Reflection contains my photography, letterpress printed excerpts from Walt Whitman's Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking, and letterpress printed in sheets and chapter dividers. The book is divided into three chapters. Each is representative, representative of a different location on the eastern half of the United States. Reflection was made in addition of 40 standard cloth bound copies and 10 full leather fine bindings. Made in the spirit of Walt Whitman's Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking, my research began by visiting the visiting the reading room at Emory University's Woodruff Library to see the first edition copy of Leaves of Grass. After playing around with various crude mock-ups, a mountain of image sequence diagrams, and months of design, I set to work on production. In these images here, you can see the various stages of my production process. The included text, chapter headings, front matter, back matter, and decorative ink sheets were all letterpress printed on a Vandercook Vander for proofing press. Each of the titles on each of the titles on the edition of fine bindings was hand lettered. And here you can see the Vandercook proofing press that I used to print this project, and then also a, a detail image of the titling on one of the fine binding copies. The decoration for, uh, for the fine binding was created with a painterly surface gilding technique. The cloth case bindings in the standard edition were foil stamped. And working on the, uh, the, the surface gilding for the, the fine binding edition, I coordinated with um, uh, Jim Reed Cunningham, who had done some research and published on surface gilding techniques for leather, paper, papyrus, and parchment. And um, actually, it's a very simple method in, in doing this. Um, the way this was done on this edition of books, I'll just go ahead and tell you, it's a watered down PVA and then uh, adhered with a, a tacking iron. And it's a patent leaf, which is uh, adhered to a, a backing, well, I believe with static charge, so you can easily handle the foil without it, without it coming off. Here you can see the excerpt from Out of the Cradle and Lucy Rocking printed on the image on the left. On the right is an image uh, from Cumberland Island, a chapter within the book. The next few slides are images from the book or taken during, uh, uh, during the, uh, the production of the book. The image on, on this slide are of Cumberland Island off the coast of Georgia. All of the images uh, from the Chesity River section of the book were taken uh, from a kayak. Here are two of those images. All of the images within the book are black and white. However, since completing this book, I've been drawn more, to, more and more towards color photography. Uh, the above image on the right was taken during the project, but was left unedited. The images that make up the final chapter of the book, Oxbow, Michigan, were taken while at paper and book intensive. Attending PBI, like the creation of this book, was another pivotal moment in my artistic and craft development. A point of departure, really. To conclude my portion of tonight's talk, uh, I would like to read an excerpt from Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking by Walt Whitman. Out of the cradle, endlessly rocking, out of the mockingbird's throat, the musical shuttle, out of the ninth month midnight, 
over the sterile sands and fields beyond where the child leaving his head, his bed wandered alone, bareheaded, barefoot, down from the showered halo, up from the mystic play of shadows twining and twisting as if they were alive. And that concludes my presentation tonight. Um, I hope that you enjoyed hearing a little bit more about the, the books that I, books and prints that I have in this exhibition. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Joe and I'll stop sharing my screen. Excellent. Thank you so very much, Kyle. And I did love hearing about those particular works because I do have to say some of those black and white uh, photographs that you have, you know, especially in, in Wander where there's the translucent page and you can see the image behind it, really, really striking and very, very haunting. But right now we'd like to turn it over to Deborah Disman and she's going to welcome you into her studio and talk a little bit about her particular book, Window Treatment, as well as her other works. Deborah. Well, hello. Thank you, Joe. And it's great to be here. Um, I'm very honored to be um, part of the show and um, to be able to, to continue the relationship um, with this particular show over the years and uh, the Georgia Center for the Book, um, et cetera. Um, and I just have to say, Kyle, that was absolutely beautiful and so moving. And um, I'm hoping we do get a chance to interact with each other towards the end because it would be really interesting to know how both Carol and Kyle um, got into working in the form of the book, which anyone who's seen the show knows can be um, a, a very wide berth. Um, and my work in, in some ways couldn't be more different than Kyle's, um, but I did relate to this, the meditative spirit and feeling um, that he expressed in his works. Um, I'm going to show a couple of works just in my studio, and then we'll see if Joe's able to, to show the book that is behind him, if it's easy. Um, we had the chance to work with Allie and create a video about different works. So there is a video available about the work I have in the show, Window Treatment. Um, but I decided I'm going to show sort of live works. <laughs> um, right here in the studio, even though we're seeing it through a screen, um, rather than uh, you know, a PowerPoint presentation. So I've been working pretty intensively in the form of the book since about 2016. Um, and I had also done a lot of bookmaking and teaching of the form um, decades earlier when I lived in the Bay Area and had grants um, through a now defunct, I believe it's defunct, um, entity called B. Dalton Bookseller. I was able to go to different libraries and teach bookmaking. Uh, we called it the art of story making and it involved creative writing and the putting together a very simple book. And I was drawn to return to the book after we moved to Los Angeles. And um, my teaching and teaching artistry, I'm a teaching artist across the uh, county of LA, teaching through a variety of different entities including museums and libraries, et cetera. Um, my teaching um, and making are very entwined. So I, I consider my practice really different grades of the same thing. Although when I teach, I teach very specific forms, um, such as the flag book structure, only people in the book world will probably know this, and so forth, so that my students can have a sense of accomplishment and really um, learn specific step-by-step -step process, um, is, and then they can go more conceptual um, if they wish. My work is very conceptual, and um, it is in the form of the book. Um, it's very, very involved with um, cloth, paper, and different kinds of threads and strings. And um, I'm going to show a piece right now called Rapunzel, and I'm not seeing myself spot lit. I, I can see a small little rectangle. So I'm going to be guiding myself using that. Um, and hopefully everyone will be, will be able to see. 
Um, I use the accordion spine, it's also called the concertina spine, very often as a connective mechanism. I love the flexibility and the movement of this spine and um, of this structure. And many of my pieces over the past several years, oh, this is great, okay. I'd rather see the books than me, but um, have been on this model. The accordion spine, which is whatever material is being used folded back and forth, um, the two covers, and then whatever kind of interior or pages I create. And I have found that working in a limited palette, um, I started primarily just with the whites and the ivories, creating depth and texture and color, I'd have to say by the layering of different materials in a related palette, um, such as ivory. And then um, I moved into black. I was intrigued with how something would look different in black or in a much darker color. I have a very strong background in color and I've been a color designer for architecture and have studied and trained intensively. But for this work, I just felt very, very drawn to the texture. and. This piece is a little bit different because it has gold and it's called Rapunzel. So it has the gold thread and the gold thread pulls back through a stitch and cascades um, onto the surface where the book is placed. Let me drop my screen a little bit here. Actually, not such a good idea, okay. Um, and this is created by a watercolor paper spine, which is covered with mulberry paper. Bookboard covers, which is a very strong cardboard, also covered with mulberry paper, but torn in strips and allowing some of the cardboard to show through. Um, it's reinforced and enhanced by canvas. And then this sort of fringe was sewn in um, using linen thread, which is very common in bookmaking. And the pages are sort of like sacks, you might say. They're, um, they're mulberry paper that is sewn together to create, and they're, they're sewn at the top. So um, I can't really open them, but they are stuffed loosely with thread and also sewn with thread. So the pages are a little more dimensional than a um, then a flat page. Um, and then at the bottom, there's a bit of fringe. I'm, I'm calling it fringe. It's, it's um, cord that sort of just, again, uh, falls to the floor. And I'm very interested in the multitude of emotional states. And again, I got to go back to Kyle's photography and the emotional states created, he was working a lot in black and white, maybe for the same reasons, wanting to work in the monochrome um, uh, and controlling the, you know, the image that way. Um, but I found that working within a limited palette and working with these materials, the papers, the cloth, um, the book board and the various strings and cords and having them be stitched and tied differently um, create, gives me an entire vocabulary with which to uh, communicate emotional states that I think are very difficult to communicate words. I may have a loose idea when I start, but I allow myself to be guided by the material. And this is called Rapunzel. Anyone who knows the Northern European fairy tale about the girl who was imprisoned in a, in a castle and she would let out her long golden hair. Um, eventually a handsome prince called, climbed up her hair and uh, they lived happily ever after. But um, there's something ineffable about it and there's something ineffable about why these layered materials um, might give a certain sensation. It can also be very, very visceral. I'm gonna show one other. This one's a little bit bigger. This one I changed quite a bit. It was more on the model of the book I just showed. And I took it apart because I really couldn't get the stuffed pages to work the way that I wanted, to, wanted them to. 
Um, but you've got, you've got the same model with the accordion spine with um, knotted strings stitched through. The covers are actually thin pieces of wood, like a balsa wood, and they're covered with the mulberry paper again, which is a very evocative material. It allows for some transparency. And then these strings are glued on and then covered with more mulberry paper to hold them in place. And then they simply, the edges simply fall out. And this book is called, and then there are strings also going through the back. So this is getting very, very sculptural. Um, and it's called Excavation of the Interior. I took out the pages and I added strings and I added this sculptural element on either side that expresses the female body. And anyone who's involved, who knows the work of Eva Hess, I'm very, very influenced by Eva Hess. She's one of the main artists um, uh, that I respond to. I, I look at a lot of artists, but um, I'm very responsive to her work with cords and strings um, and natural materials and plastics, although I use, I don't use this. And she actually had a lot of her work fabricated, it looks very handmade. My work is very painstakingly handmade. So this is a shape created simply by coiling the hemp cord. I use a lot of hemp cord and linen thread and jute. And again, it's the monochrome, the white on white on white on white. And the last one I'm gonna show for my studio. Oh, one other thing about this one is that the books are now, you know, can I still call them a book if they're not having traditional pages? The strings are standing in for the pages. And another one I have on a similar model is called, It's Not Black and White. And this is actually canvas that was black canvas that was folded into an accordion, uh, into an accordion structure. And then the strings, and I'm showing them here because I haven't had them photographed yet. The strings again are, st are stitched from the inside and allowed to cascade over. The, uh, it's attached th simply through a stitch, it's hard to, not a glue. And it is covered with that incredible mulberry paper and then strips of typewriter uh, emulsion ribbon that you just can't find anymore. I've been hoarding this for years and I used most of it up. So it looks like it says something, but it's the ribbon on now old fashioned typewriters um, once you've used up you know, the ink and you basically see the letter coming through in white and it shows the white background and then hemp cord. So again, it's all about these layering and juxtaposition of materials and way of putting them together and ways of stitching um, to create um, a feeling and I'm really discovering it as I go. And it's called, It's Not Black and White. That really does reflect um, the racial and political turmoil that we've been experiencing, particularly over the past two years. And the idea of questions not being black and white and people wanting to make them black and white. And again, these, these strings are standing in for the pages. So I have to find out as I go along if these will still be seen as books, it depends on, I guess, how traditional the venue is. But I am inspired by the book and the concept of the book, um, whether it be the Western Codex with the two covers and the pages or other styles and the meaning of the book, which again, um, there's a lot of definitions, but it is somewhat ineffable. It, it has a resonance for people in many, many different ways through information, um, through communication and expression and reading, whether you're reading an image or whether you're reading a color or whether you're reading a photograph or whether you're reading words or simply letters or, um, or symbols. Um, so that's what I wanted to contribute. And if Joe would like to show the window treatment or if you just want to let people look at the film, 
Um, the window treatment is, again, it has the accordion spine with the covers, but it also has, uh, it's a flat structure, meaning it has sort of like envelopes that come out in different directions. And within those envelopes are cards that have um, the strings, those ever-loving strings that are stitched. And it's well, you know, I, Go I, ahead. I have to say, Deborah, that um, you know, I think that artists who get into this exhibition do need to thank you uh, because it's because of your work and the strings that we decided to buy glass shelves uh, because it was one of your pieces that had those wonderful cascading strings that when it came in, I, I felt that it needed to be on a, a floating, it needed to look like it was floating and the oh. glass shelves allowed it to sort of like cascade over the edge and it, it, great shadows. And um, so I think everyone needs to thank you for helping us upgrade our display here at the Decatur Library. Um, but yeah, once a lovely, your sort of windows that allow things to peek through between the, the cascading strings and the stitching on the back. That's one of the things I liked about this work too, is that when you look at it, the stitching on the back of one side is the cascading strings on the other as well. Um, but then you, you also had, um, you know, you're in working with your monochrome colors, you had a, uh, a black one in the exhibit last year or the year before that kind of replicated a jail cell with the strings hanging down that was very, very effective. Um, and I do have to say, I very much like that black and white one. And I do like how you talked about you, can you call it a book? You know, when we moved the ex exhibition over here to the library from its previous location uh, for the fourth show, you know, it was Dot and Moy who really had to convince me, you know, as I was standing there saying, if it doesn't have any writing on it, can we call it a book? And, you know, she, she kind of like had to pull me along in the, the book objects and we need to look past the word into the page and into the sculpture and, and see a, a book is something that you don't, don't just read physically with a word, but read as a sculpture and read as a piece of art. So I think that's a very, very valid and necessary argument and, and discussion to have as well. So really very quickly, we want to get on to our third artist this evening as well. And then we can have that wonderful discussion with all three of you. Um, so Carol, let's bring you on to discuss your three pieces in the show. Um, homage to Hannah Moore, pressing on numbers 91. 98 and 106. So Carol, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thanks. Hey. Thanks so much. Um, let's see, I'm sharing here. I think everyone should be seeing my slide, first slide. Um, Carol Constat, I live in um, upstate New York, about two, hours north of New York City in Hudson Valley and um, delighted to be here. I thank everyone for making this possible. I've participated in the book as art in previous years, volume five, volume six this year, and also the flight edition that was at the airport. And that was a wonderful experience as well. Um, I work in series. And so what that means is I start to get interested. I do a lot of research. Essentially, a, I work with antique books. I deconstruct them and they find me. They come into my life and that is my concentration probably for a couple of years, up to 10 years. It depends on the series. So the series that's in the show this year is called Pressing On, as Joe has said. And um, let's see. Let me see, sorry. Oh, right, okay, sorry. <laughs> oh no. Hmm. 
Okay, this is one of the pieces that Joe mentioned. I have three in the show and this does not look like a book, obviously. Um, this paper in this entire series was from a book from 1791 that I picked up in a rare bookstore. It was a $20 book. It was printed in London. And when I checked the title, it turned out that although it was published anonymously, it was by Hannah Moore. I had no idea who Hannah Moore was. So I started the search and discovered she was this most amazing woman, born in 1745 and lived to 1833 in the UK. So every, uh, I didn't know what to do with this book when I first got it, but um, many years later, I received an iron that was my mom's after she passed. And when I held this object, it somehow connected that this would be a good vehicle to match and work with the book, pages from the book. So, this is the book, the original cover, the leather cover and what's left of the contents. Um, the interesting thing for me has been to get into the real essence of who Hannah Moore was, what she was um, wildly passionate about, and that was educating women having them be literate so that their worlds could be elevated. They could elevate the life of their children and the families. And she was a proponent of literacy for the poor. She started 16 charitable schools and her entire life was devoted to abolishing slavery. So why sad irons? <laughs> um, what I'm showing you here are, are, is again, one that's in the show. This is what I start with. So I have bought them one by one. I did not collect them previously. And I sit with each object and then I determine what I want to do with them. And each one fed the next one. This is the third piece that's in the show and in, in the library. And it really is an exploration of materials. This is linen thread. As uh, Deborah said, it's very common in book, book world. Um, and I've woven the paper and I've sewn into the paper. And um, I very early on started scorching the paper, which just seemed to fit perfectly with um, the irons. And I'm going to show you a lot of them just to give you the scope of what I've been exploring using the irons and all these materials. Um, you can see the ends of this one here in the middle is scorched. I don't always scorch the, the paper or the threads, but often I do. Um, these are very scorched. And the reason that started was the one on the left um, has the end paper from the book. And right here at the bottom, you can see there's some letters. And the person who had owned the book had burnt in their name. And so when I saw that, that was like a eureka moment. Oh, I have to start scorching. <laughs> This is another one where I've knotted it so that it has a netting kind of effect and scorched the ends. Um, so I'm very interested in the contrast that it's happening, the hardness of the metal and the softness of lace and threads and textiles. Um, and, you know, there are definitely words that you can read, but I'm not doing this to present any kind of literal reading. It's just to evoke 
a sensibility of the women that were laboring with the heat, <laughs> trying to press garments and linens and the servitude over the years and the implication of their efforts and the confinements of their world um, and how they have persevered, thus the title. This is lace that, you know, my, my grandfather was a lace designer. Um, the previous one was lace that my mom had worn. So there's a personal element to some of, some of these, but um, this too, my grandmother tatted this lace. And you can see these are very small. These are about two and three inches high. Here's a, a circle which shows you the variation in size. And what I'd like to say about this is that I started to make these groupings in my studio um, as they accumulated. And it was a very intuitive formation for me to to create and it's very satisfying to me to do this because I think that it, it evokes uh, a sisterhood and a community and I'm, I'm very interested in that. And so as they accumulated, the, the numbers increased and the feeling of that community increased and the, um, yeah, so they stand, they stand alone as single pieces, but I think the minute I started this series, I was very interested in seeing many, many, many together. And I originally had the idea of 50 in mind, but I doubled that by now. Um, I mentioned the contrast and so yes, it's not just the softness and the hardness, but also the tension that um, using these tacks brings up and the threatening quality is interesting to me. And um, the, hard, the hard life that, that women had to tolerate. Um, this is on a vintage ironing board, which has this amazing scorched iron for formation on it that um, I have also displayed them on vintage boards, which is you know very different than a pedestal in a gallery or a shelf. There's another one with scorched sandpaper. Um, and then I, I, a friend gave me some fur from a collar, from a coat, and I just had to try using fur. And, you know, the sensuousness of that was, was very compelling. This is lamb's wool. The previous one was um, raccoon. And uh, getting back to the, the threads, I experienced the threads as um, extensions of of, of the language, but also as a reminder of the temporal quality of, of the work. You know, knotting takes time and leaving long threads in, and knotting it along the threads um, gives, gives the, the impression of passages of time. And I think history and memory is just so fascinating and compelling. And this is how I'm communicating that. These are our doilies. Um, and then this was a linen bed, bed basket liner, which I, I cut and scorched. So after I, I had display, you know, had shown them singly, I had many instances where I was invited to um, start showing them as groupings. You can see a circular installation here. Um, and this is the same location. It was an old bank building. So what you're seeing in the back is actually the vault to the bank. So it was very interesting of the, the metal of the irons with the bank vault behind it. Um, 
and this one mostly is all textiles. Uh, this is my largest installation, which was on a historic table built by a, a woman fabricated it um, around the same time as the iron. So it was a really nice match. Um, and there were 86 irons on this installation. And that propelled me to think about um, telling this story in another way, which was to create a book. And so I have worked, collaborated with my son, who's a photographer and book designer, and I have a limited edition. And um, we shot the work so that the scale of the irons is evident. And it's another way to put the work out into the world and share it. Um, and I think that's, that's all I had to say. <laughs> so anyway, this is back to the one that's in uh, the show. Excellent. Well, thank you so very much, Carol. And, you know, we do love your pieces in the show. And, you know, looking at how you displayed them in, in so many of them with, you know, the lace, and I love how that's actually connected to your own family history. But, you know, speaking of size-wise, um, because, you know, there's the, the very small one that we have here, as opposed to the mm -hmm. size one, <laughs> which wasn't on the, uh, there's a reason it wasn't on that glass shelf this evening because it was a little heavy. Um, but, you know, speaking of it, you know, ironing being women's work and things, you know, they all had a purpose. You know, there's a reason that the tiny iron, you know, it was used for different materials for different, different places. And, you know, you just sometimes didn't have one iron that you had to deal with. You had multiple irons as well. And, um, you know, I remember my great grandmother had um, an iron, old, like one of these older irons that um, became a doorstop. You right. know, she, she, you know, sewed a, a cloth over it and became a doorstop. But you know, keeping them the right temperature that you needed too was was different. And I guess why there's that great scorch mark on that one vintage board. Um, you know, there were there were it was very labor intensive. Yeah. To, to, to iron, um, you know, and, and seen as women's work. So I think it's absolutely amazing um, with the book and, you know, once again, challenging what, what a book is, um, right. you know, I think is also amazing as well. So, um, but this one's sizable and it has a little bit of the mm -hmm. um, sandpaper right. on the point as well. Excellent. Well, let's go ahead and bring you all up. So if you want to turn your videos up, we can start chatting and we welcome the audience members. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A and, and ask our artists questions about their work, particular work um, in the show. And, you know, maybe Carol, you can tell the folks this evening if there are any left, how if they are interested maybe to get one of those limited edition books that feature all your work as well. Um, but Deborah, I know that you wanted to maybe chat with Kyle and, and talk about loss and emotion in work as well. Well, I, I do, and I would love to hear how both of these artists got involved with making art and with their current work, you know, as bookmakers. But before that, I'd love to say to Carol, first of all, I wondered if you were at all inspired by Merritt Oppenheim um, <laughs> with her fur teacup. That's one thing. And I was also very struck by the hard and the soft, but both relating to women's work with the cloth and the lace making, and then also the ironing and the laundry. Um, so I, I was entranced. I took a lot of notes um, right on my workspace table <laughs> so that's one thing I had towards um Carol and Carol and I have been communicating I think a few years mm -hmm. um I agree with her cascading strings and right um, that, that was that was me so I don't know Carol if you want to answer and then um Kyle can just jump in on his 
sources, perhaps? Um, the merit oftentimes, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I was consciously thinking about her, but obviously she was in my, my uh, being and many people do bring her up when they see the irons with the fur, it's, it's unavoidable. <laughs> Um, also, Man Ray had done an iron, which was called the gift, which had tacks down kind of a spine of the front of the iron. Um, you know, it's, it's and that I, I was not aware of when I started using the tacks either, I have to say. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I'm in good company. Let's put it that way. Um, and uh, I forgot what, what else I was going to say about this. Um, what did you ask me? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, the, the idea of the woman's work and the hard and the soft, you know, mm -hmm. contrast with the hard and the soft with the soft materials and the lace. Mm -hmm. Lace is women's work, sewing is women's work, right. um, but also laundry and ironing, which uses, mm -hmm. you know, ironing uses this you know, it, even though they're contrasting materials, um, it's all, you know, what women have traditionally done. The labor, yeah. Well, I think what Joe was saying, I mean, it, when I, I don't, I've never really ironed with these irons. I must say, I tried heating them up. They take an enormous amount of heat to get them hot. And it, they are, um, you know, you do need many of them so that you can have a rotation going because they cool down. Uh, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling to me that, you know, they were first of all using textiles that were linen, cotton, maybe silk. They're all very difficult to iron and very susceptible to scorching or burning. Plus the handles of all these irons are metal. And so, the user would get easily burned, I would think. And also they're heating them on ovens that are coal or wood fueled. So the soot could be a problem. The ash could be a problem. It's just incredibly uh, labor intensive, but I also am aware that Monday was washing day and Tuesday was pressing day. And so I think that often it was a very social activity as well. So maybe that relieved the burdens, um, you know, where multiple women would be doing this side by side. Um, and so that gives me some pleasure to think of that. <laughs> um, I gave a talk at one of my installations and someone pointed out to me that uh, they knew a, a woman who had come from Poland and got a job in Connecticut and New Britain in a factory that was producing the irons and how wonderful that was and how glad she was to have a job and the social activity of the job, you know, networking and meeting other women. And so, you know, there's, it's never um, all bad or all good. You know, there's lots, lots of stories, I think, all, all gray matter in between of the whole experience. But um, so it's not just about domesticity, but also because Hannah Moore was an abolitionist, I really felt compelled with her story and her, her drive to um, never give up. And I think that's the message I want it to relay now is that we can't give up. It's, we have to persevere. I mean, Texas has now abolished, you know, the abortion law and um, we still have work to do. So that's, that's the message of the work. I think too, you know, it's also very much talking about class. The people who, there was a class of women that never touched those things. Maybe they did a little, you know, lace making, um, but uh, they, you know, they didn't necessarily touch the irons. It was a certain class of people. And I also harken back to, De to Degas' images of the laundresses. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really, there's a lot of layers there. A lot of layers, yeah.
I, I just wanted to chime in and say both of you have very visually striking work and it, it's it's very wonderful and also uh material materiality wise it's they're very striking i i really enjoy your use of materials and how everything comes together and they have meaning embedded within everything that you're using uh carol and deborah it's it's very cool how that's coming together um i i, I was wondering if um I had a question, but it kind of uh, escapes me at the moment. Um, in terms of bookness and and defining, not necessarily defining what is book, um, but I was curious to, to to know like interactions with your pieces, Carol. Like in in a gallery setting, um, do you encourage viewers to 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 go through and? Uh, maybe pick up one of the irons and kind of examine I, I know that for some of them a little bit might be a little bit more delicate than others but uh for those that are more um readable in a in a um, stereotypical bibliographic sort of way um i don't know if you had any thoughts on that that's just i'm curious about um i don't have an ever i i'm not encouraging people to touch them but uh, on the other hand I can't see why they would hold themselves back. <laughs> I mean, they're very tactile and um, very touchable. And when I did that long table that I showed with the 86 irons, the curator and director said, you know, how, where am I in that? Can people touch these? And should we put a sign up, do not touch? And I, we didn't put a sign up because it seemed fruitless. I mean, there was no harm done and um, it was a safe environment and I felt perfectly fine if, if somebody wanted to touch them. I think, I think they beckon you to touch them, kind of. I'm not, I'm not putting that out there, no, yeah. people, uh, but, but yeah, they're so def tactile. Definitely yeah. see the, uh, the, the, the wanting to touch them, just looking at them on the screen to seeing the juxtaposition between the, the paper and then the semi singed paper with that hard iron. It's, it, it was, is quite nice. Mm. Thank, um, you. Thank you. I, I have to say, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but the three that are there with you, Joe, in the show um, are, are three that I submitted particularly because I was playing with the juxtaposition of the text and the type and you know it's a, it's it's an amazing book in that you know it's all letters letter set but letterpress and um the quality of the paper at that time it's acid free it's it's wonderful to work with and there's an amazing um mix up that happens when I cut up in strips and weave it or not weave it and layer it. And I've always been a lo in love with type and language. And I did calligraphy as a young artist. And so I was really focused on that with those pieces that you have there more than some of the other ones that I showed. Yeah. I just want to say too, I think there's a frightening quality to them as well. And I'm not saying that in any negative way, but you know, when I see an iron, I always wonder, is it hot? Is it gonna burn me? Because you have all those singed things and then you have the the tacks. So, you know, the tension with all of those things, I think yeah. it's yeah. very tension. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, do you know if any uh, any of the uh, participants have any questions? I see there's some attendees here. There are some attendees. I haven't seen anybody pop in with a question. Um, you know, but folks, if you want to feel free to jump on in. Um, you know, we have three wonderful artists, very different styles of bookmaking um, and, and treating book objects differently. Um, but I'm not seeing any come in right off hand. Um, hold on. We got one. Let me go into the chat. Sorry, it's like um, Deborah wanted to, how everyone got there. Right. Let's go back to Deborah's question about how everyone got started in book arts. What drew you to the form or challenging the form of the book? 
So uh, I was posing our, a question to Kyle, so maybe Kyle should. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, um, how how I guess we uh, got involved in the book or working with the book form. Um, I was introduced to the book arts in, in undergrad, and I took a book arts course. And uh, afterward, I got hold of Keith Smith's books, and I went through and made just about all of the structures in them. And um, then uh, I, you know, I was looking at grad programs, printmaking programs, and then uh, my, one of my professors suggested to look at Alabama. And so the craft really is what draw me to the book. So the, the book as a structure, a mode of communication with a material history. And so knowing about how all of those pieces come together is really what draw me to working in the book. I previously had a background in printmaking with some photographic things thrown in. And so that um, in terms of artistic expression, it just had felt natural to, to flow into that. Um, you know, there's always questions about like, should it be a book or like, can, can you express it without it being in book form uh, are always relevant questions. Um, but I think in some ways, um, providing creative work, two-dimensional creative work or three-dimensional creative work in the form of a book, um, recontextualize it in, in a meaningful way. So the photographs that I included, for instance, and by themselves in a gallery setting, yes, may speak as, as a, a singular body of work, but in book form, they relate to not just themselves, but also the, the history of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so Walt Whitman in particular and his Leaves of Grass, then also his work with uh, um, with printing. And I believe that he did a, a number of, printed a number of books himself or had a hand in typesetting. Mm -hmm. um, so that, yeah, it's a roundabout way of saying uh, how I got into the field. But um, yeah, I would love to hear uh, what, you both have to say, uh, Deborah. Since you asked, I wonder if you can uh, take it. I can just remember sketchbooks. You know, always working with the book in some way, because I love the private, public nature of it and all the hidden spaces. You know, you have an object, and a book is always a sculpture. I mean, unless I mean, you do see broadsides in book shows, which are you know single sheets. Um, but primarily it's a three-dimensional object. So everybody has the challenge of how to present it because, you know, for the most part, you can't, um, you can't show the whole thing, whether it be under a glass case or just standing free. The only way to really see the whole thing is to, is to really pick it up and go through the whole thing. So that's a tension that I think lends kind of um, an aura of, of mystery and, um, you know, and, and just kind of a challenge to it. I always, you know, did um, journals and collecting things in a book and then drawings, which are often your sketches, because I was, you know, trained as a painter with drawing, painting, printmaking. Um, it, it, often a lot of your most innovative work is these sketches because you don't feel inhibited as you might when you go to make the final painting. Um, and I just, we started to realize there was kind of a vibrating life between the covers of these sketchbooks or these journals. Um, and so, you know, when I first started teaching a really long time ago at the Dion Museum Art School, which doesn't exist anymore in San Francisco, I had a class called the Art of Journal and Notebook Keeping. Didn't really know what I was doing, but it was really fun. We did some making, we did some writing. And so it's always kind of been there um, because I, I went to the University of Iowa in the poetry workshop as well as in the printmaking department and the painting department. So it was also a way to put those two things together and that's more of a traditional path. But I would say in the last five years, um, you know, I started teaching it when I moved to LA and I started making things, you know, making these, these, these pieces, these books based on these structures that I was learning or had learned and I was stitching them and then I realized I was very drawn to the thread and then I was tying them off and I was very drawn to how the, the ends would flow down and I can trace back through works from the last five years getting to what I'm you know, doing now. Um, I just found that it was, it was just a visceral expressive way um, of capturing something that, although there might be words involved, 
was hard to describe and kind of the spaces in between things in between what we're presenting, what we're really feeling, um, between what we're told what's happening and what seems to actually be happening that you sense or feel. Um, and yet the form of the book, it's a very deep part of my history, both culturally and familiarly, from, uh, from family, you know, going to the library, taking out, you know, 10, 15 books, riding the bicycle home, throwing yourself down in the backyard, starting to read them right away. Um, so it's really hard to, to really concretize it, but I do know that it's all woven together. And I, tr I strive to, I strive to allow people into that world through my teaching by giving them specific forms to work with. Um, it, you know, I would never give someone just a blank canvas. I would teach them a structure, I would teach them a set of techniques so they have something to hang their hat on and then they can move forward, you know, from that. So it's hard to know what's next, but I think we're all gonna keep going. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm really struck because I think we all are um, very committed to the book, but also to the execution. You know, Kyle, your production is immaculate and also very sensitive. So I think I think we've been paired well tonight, um, and the yeah the feeling states that we're evoking are very powerful places to go, and I think that's what books can do, um, and I think that's uh, I'm very interested in the intimacy of the experience with the book, whether it's reading or poetry, you know. Um, poetry or prose. And um, what I discovered in my first working with books is that books absorb history. So uh, this first book that came into my life was from 1844. And it was a book of Psalms and hymns that was used in public worship. And I bought it thinking I would use it in a collage because I had been doing collage layering and being very involved with paper for many, many years. And when I started to handle the pages in the book, um, I sensed that this was a totally different realm <laughs> of paper and experience. And that was in about 2006. So that was my first um, instance with working with an antique book and deconstructing it. And that series is my sacred poems. And I worked about 10 years with two volumes of that same book and incorporated the weaving and threads, gold threads and gold leaf. And um, it went from two dimensional into three dimensional work. And so that was the beginning of my journey with books or book art, I should say, altered books. And um, yeah, I'm completely, uh, I guess seduced, you would say. <laughs> and the, the only other thing I want to put out there is that the book that I have produced, the limited edition book that I've produced with my son uh, on Pressing On is available. I still have copies and it's on my website. If you go to my website, there's um, a page will we'll bring you information about the book. So I encourage people to look at that as well as my other series, which are in my gallery. Thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you all so very much. And as we wrap up, thank you, Carol, for of course, reminding us about your website. Kyle, is, do you have a particular website that we could do a quick shout out for as well as Deborah where other, uh, where folks can go and find other pieces of your work and, and uh, maybe browse the rest of your collection? Um, yeah, there. Mm -hmm. uh, DebraDisman.com is my website, and it, it holds, I mean, it, <laughs> it's always hard to keep up with getting your work photographed, but um, it has work and um, events and places I'm going to be teaching and so forth. So just my name.com. And Kyle? Yeah, mine is actually the same. It's, it's uh, KyleAnthonyClark.com. So full name, no punctuation in between, just Kyle Anthony Clark. And uh, that's that's it, it'll take you to my website. It's a portfolio um, website more than anything, um, but you can see some things that I've worked on over over the years. And uh, if anything, 
you know, looks interesting, reach out. Um, otherwise, yeah, I hope that we, I hope to work with you all in the future. Yeah, it's, it's been great. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we are very, very pleased to have, you know, Deborah and Carol submitting uh, multiple years and, and, you know, definitely the, the book is art flight edition was a very, very special exhibition at the airport. I was so very happy to work with Dot Moy in, in setting that up over multiple nights at the airport. It was truly an experience. But once again, I thank you all so very much for participating in this chat and of course, participating in Book as Art, not just this year, but for as many years as you participated. Of course, we have another artist talk coming up next week and you can find information about how to register for that one in the chat. Also check out bookasart.com. You will see the entire catalog for this year's exhibition. And don't forget some of the works are available for purchase and those purchases will help support the Decatur Arts Alliance. Once again, thank you, Kyle, Deborah, and Carol for giving us your time this evening. And thank you all for inviting us into your homes tonight. We hope to see you again very, very soon. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.